Um, we'll look at Renegade Cuts. Henry Kissinger's a war criminal video. It's 20 minutes long. Um, this will uh, most likely feature, uh, you know, Cambodia bombing. Like a lot of the stuff that we talked about, Laos, uh, Vietnam, that sort of thing. I don't know if we should watch this, actually, because there's more... In her book and in this last debate, she talked about getting the approval or the support or the mentoring of Henry Kissinger. Now, I find it rather amazing because I happen to believe that Henry Kissinger was one of the most destructive secretaries of state in the modern history of this country. I am proud to say that Henry Kissinger is not my friend. I will not take advice from Henry Kissinger. And in fact, Kissinger's actions in Cambodia, when the United States bombed that country, overthrew Prince Sino. Henry Kissinger can Kissinger my ass. That's what he should have said. He would have won. Created the instability for Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge to come in, who then butchered some three million innocent people one of the worst genocides in the history of the world. So count me in as somebody who will not be listening to Henry Kissinger. This tense exchange between Senator Bernie Sanders and Secretary Hillary Clinton received a fair amount of media attention during the 2016 Democratic primaries. Sanders denounced former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger for his actions in Cambodia, in stark contrast to the traditional view of Kissinger as an American hero, patriot, and diplomat emeritus. In 1970, Kissinger opened back channels between the United States and China, ultimately resulting in the establishment of formal diplomatic relations in 1972. The left praised Kissinger for his surprising diplomacy with a communist state during the Cold War, and the right praised him for achieving his secondary goal, driving a wedge between China and the Soviet Union, diminishing the latter's attempts to further its influence in Asia. Kissinger's outreach to China was, in fact, in service of capitalism. Due to this Cold War diplomacy and other affairs throughout his career, Kissinger gained a lifelong status as an advisor to future presidents. Kissinger urged President Bill Clinton to- Dude, that fucked me up when you said bro, Kojima was watching you last night, watching Hanabi. One day, dude. One day he'll be watching Hasanabi, okay? I'll die. To focus on NAFTA instead of healthcare. Kissinger was a secret consultant to the George W. Bush administration, once urging the expansion of the War on Terror. Of this, Kissinger once stated, because Afghanistan was not enough, and we need to humiliate them. In 2016, the Barack Obama administration honored Kissinger with an award ceremony where he received a Distinguished Public Service Medal. Until the final months of the Donald Trump administration, Kissinger served on the Defense Policy Board, an influential group of experts advising top Pentagon officials. Kissinger, 98 years old, has only now disappeared into the background and has no more influence on United States foreign policy, as far as we know. The traditional view of Kissinger has been held together through normalization of his presence and advice throughout the presidential administrations. Speaking ill of Kissinger comes from the media, from fact-checkers, from firebrand politicians with nothing to lose, but never from the top. It is well understood, but never openly acknowledged by the president, that Henry Kissinger is a war criminal. While United States foreign policy has been responsible for a tremendous amount of suffering and clandestine crimes over the past century even without Kissinger's direct involvement, his contributions to this suffering are staggering in amount and scale. According to an estimate by The Nation, though an exact number may never be known, approximately 3 to 4 million deaths can be attributed to Kissinger's actions. When confronted- Oh, the one thing I wanted to say with Noah is that the idea that Henry Kissinger is like this unique, brilliant fucking diplomat is so stupid because his belligerent strategies would unironically lead to tremendous amounts of actual failure under any other nation. It's only because he was in the United States of America that he was able to, to be considered this uh, person because it was always, almost always a failure and a very violent one 
It's just that he was able to continue failing uh, and failing over and over again and maintain this uh, presence of being this brilliant diplomat by schmoozing with the fucking media and doing uh, uh, doing a, a tremendous amount of access journalism. But this kind of deal-making would not work for any other country. You would never in a million years consider someone who operated like him to be a good or smart statesman. I, like, I was thinking about it, and it's like, it's like later, uh, like Gaddafi, like later on in his life. You know what I mean? Like, you, you wouldn't, like, most people would probably not look at Gaddafi and go, like, that's, like, he did some good things, and he did some belligerent things, but you wouldn't consider him to be, like, this, um tremendous like elderly statesman for his incomprehensible indecipherable uh, attitude whereas when it comes down to what this is not real Netanyahu's liquid party plan to assassinate Henry Kissinger according to state department official wait what A radical faction within the Likud party plotted to kill Kissinger in 1977, according to a news report from the time. Wait, why? What were they going to kill him? Wait, why would they want to kill him? His admin literally was giving fucking... Why not? What do you mean? Why would they? His admin was unironically, like, dealing with Egypt while simultaneously fucking funneling money into... Uh, funneling weapons into Israel. What the fuck? That's friendly fire, my friend. Nineteen seventy three war that also led to the damaging oil embargo by Arab states against the US and Kissinger was said to be willing to cut any deal necessary to turn the spigot back on, which the nineteen seventy four disengagement deal accomplished. Wait, that's why? Uh, while Kissinger succeeded in a short time. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll do this in a second. Let's just with watch these this. colossal figures, several questions come to mind. What did Kissinger do to cause this much damage? And decades later, with irrefutable evidence now collected, why won't anyone do anything about it? Doors open. Why are American politicians with blood on their hands never tried as war criminals in international courts? Yeah, Henry why? Kissinger had reason to be paranoid, trauma that contributed to his cynical view of the truth and of humanity, and a career built upon the necessity of suspicion. In 1938, when Kissinger was only 15, he and his family fled Germany to escape persecution. In 1943, Kissinger, like so many other young men of that era, was drafted by the United States to fight in World War II. His knowledge of Germany and his academic studies up to that point allowed him to join military intelligence. He was charged with identifying, arresting, and interrogating German officers, as well as securing confidential informants. According to Greg Grandin, author of Kissinger's Shadow, the tension between fact and truth was not an abstract question for Kissinger. It was the stuff of life and death. In 1955, Kissinger joined the National Security Council's Operations Coordinating Board. He grew to prominence through a series of books that influenced foreign policy. No, um... His, his, uh, I mean, everything I've read about his, like, uh, his involvement in World War II is actually pretty good. Like, his job was as a German speaking, uh, German Jew who, um, immigrated into the United States before the Nazi Party takeover, I believe, or during the Nazi Party. Was it, I think it might have been, like, a little bit before the Nazi Party takeover or immediately after. Um, he played a significant role and and uh he did a he did a uh he did a really good job like there was something i saw where he would put out like he was really smart he would put out i know a couple of men yeah salak bu bu adamlar wait hold on i'll do it again hold on one second all right it's unlocked 
Um, he would uh, he would put out flyers. So, because like a lot of Nazis hid, right? So he would put out flyers in German, looking for uh, people, looking for uh, police work. So he would put out flyers asking for those with police experience, policing experience. And then in one instance, um, someone called in and was like, oh, that's me. Um, I, I have uh, police experience. And he apparently jokingly asked Gestapo. And he was like, yeah. So then he arrested him and then used him uh, as a, uh, used him as a, uh, as a, as a mole to arrest uh, higher up the fucking uh, totem pole. Policy. In his 1957 book, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, Kissinger advocated the use of nuclear weapons in warfare. In his 1960 book, The Necessity of Choice, Kissinger helped popularize the Cold War term, Missile Gap. These writings influenced policy in the Kennedy administration and encouraged the creation of enough nuclear weapons to wipe out mankind many times over. Proliferation also resulted in a series of close calls over the years that nearly did just that. On March 31st, 1968, with a low approval rating due to the war in Vietnam, President Lyndon B. Johnson appeared on national television and announced that he was partially halting the bombing of Vietnam and that he would not run for re-election. Not long after that, Kissinger contacted a Richard Nixon campaign aide, pledging fealty to Nixon and stating that he would do anything to help him win the presidency. This blanket pledge of anything was soon put to the test. That same year, Kissinger helped Nixon covertly sabotage the Paris peace talks. The goal of the peace talks was to end a devastating conflict that had already killed countless Americans and Vietnamese. The goal of Kissinger and Nixon was to prevent Hubert Humphrey and the Democratic Party from ending an unpopular war ahead of an election. Nixon, through Kissinger, privately assured the South Vietnamese that an incoming Republican administration would offer them a better deal than the Democrats. By sabotaging the peace talks, Kissinger was able to sabotage Humphrey's electoral strategy as well. The North Vietnamese wanted the war to end, but every time the North side came close to an agreement, the US-backed South Vietnamese suddenly increased their own demands, making peace impossible. The South Vietnamese withdrew from the talks on the eve of the election. President Johnson learned of this because the CIA had bugged the office of the South Vietnamese president and the FBI had bugged the South Vietnamese embassy. CIA recordings and phone calls confirmed this long suspected rumor. And they oughtn't to be doing this. This is treason. I know. I know. One of the greatest things that came out of all this is that, like, this period had so much paranoia that uh, they fucking... I mean, I guess they still bug the shit out of every aspect of the White House and everywhere else. But, like, specifically Nixon, too. Like, he, he's just so paranoid that there's just literally uh, endless amounts of information out know there. Know this. That they're contacting well, was bugging operations. a foreign power in the middle of a war. After speaking to that Republican, Johnson called Nixon and confronted him about this treasonous act, but was unwilling to go public as it would reveal how he learned of it in the first place. Kissinger tried to rewrite history for the victor, Richard Nixon, painting Humphrey and his emissaries as failures for even attempting diplomacy against such an implacable enemy. And by painting the war in Vietnam, not the disastrous anti-communist quagmire that it was, but as an inevitability that they simply had to meet. Throughout the conflict in Vietnam and neighboring nations, the belligerents varied in their attitudes. Some were reluctant participants, drafted into service or ordered to commit questionable acts under the mistaken belief that there was no alternative. But Kissinger cannot be given such a defense. He knew that peace was an alternative because he himself helped sabotage that peace. This lack of alibi should be taken into consideration when learning about atrocities in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia with his fingerprints on them. The nations of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia formed a region commonly called Indochina, but the three nations' involvement during the Vietnam War could not be more different. Laos and Cambodia were effectively neutral during the conflict, but both the North Vietnamese and the United States used the video is Henry Kissinger's a war criminal by renegade cut these territories, often covertly, without the explicit authorization of said nations. 
However, the manner in which these territories were exploited were quite different. For example, the North Vietnamese used Laotian and Cambodian territory as part of their supply lines. The United States, on the other hand, exploited Laos and Cambodia by carpet bombing their civilians, men, women, and children, in hopes of also striking any unsuspecting North Vietnamese who happened to be there. The Nixon administration called this hot pursuit, a justification for tremendous intentional civilian casualties. While a great many atrocities- The Nixon administration is so good at coming up with dumbass fucking names for their dumbass policies that were an abject failure and very violent. Even like strategic ambiguity. Like every part of it is just like, strategic ambiguity is uh, our, our, uh, our method of dealing with China, okay? And what strategic ambiguity implies is we recognize China, we recognize the, the uh, communist government of China as the actual China, okay? Uh, we no longer recognize uh, the KMT nor Taiwan as the real China. It is no longer the Republic of China. It is the PRC. While simultaneously, we will continue arming uh, Taiwan. Now, a normal person without uh, multiple degrees from Harvard would probably look at that and go, wait a minute, you recognize this, uh, you recognize China as China and no longer Taiwan as China, but you're still arming and funding uh, uh, Taiwan and using it as a, using it as a destabilizing factor and pushing for their independence while simultaneously they're like a run by a fascist militia, a fascist nationalist government. I, you're, you call that strategic ambiguity, but it sounds a lot like you're just lying, which is exactly what it was. It's lying. Strategic ambiguity is just lying. Okay. Just like, uh, uh, just like this, uh, like what, what we're talking about here, uh, shuttle diplomacy, all of these things, all of these things that Nixon uh, administration uh, uh, put fancy names pursuit. on. A justification was just, for tremendous intentional yeah, hot civilian pursuit. casualties. <laughs> While a great many atrocities were hot committed pursuit. by United States. Also known as indiscriminate bombing or genocide. You know what I mean? Carpet bombing an entire fucking country indiscriminately. AKA genocide its forces within Indochina, the actions masterminded by Henry Kissinger were among the worst. During the first week of the Richard Nixon administration, the bombing halt was over. Kissinger himself ordered the Pentagon to present a classified briefing on bombing options. Only weeks later, the United States began secretly bombing Cambodia. The political argument against the bombing was self-evident. The United States was not at war with Cambodia. The total victims of the Cambodia bombings are disputed, partially because different historians and government officials use different criteria for who was directly killed by the United States, and most studies do not include victims of U.S. involvement with the Khmer Rouge. But low estimates, such as in the Tufts University study, suggest approximately 250,000 dead, but the highest estimates huh. reach 600,000. Again, this is only for the- I drive the strategic ambiguity line with my mom. She didn't buy it. Yeah, I told my mom I'm going to take the trash out, and then I just simply didn't take the trash out. I, uh, she called that lying. I called that strategic ambiguity. These bombings, not the conflict across Indochina in total or the Khmer Rouge genocide. There were also significant casualties in Laos. U.S. bombings in Laos were conducted secretly beginning in 1964. And How come Cambodia didn't declare war against us? Bitch, what do you mean? We did ethnic cleansing. What are you talking about? Like, with what? What were they supposed to do? You know what the guys that fucking actually took took advantage of the destabilization did? Oh, that's right. They killed three million more people, including every motherfucker with glasses, okay? So the idea that, like, <laughs> the idea that they were going to go and, and, and fucking go, uh, kill... Uh, America or declare war against America like that's crazy <laughs> why doesn't the ant declare war on the magnifying glass yeah literally Kissinger was so unattractive you know if you were a woman no way he would have rose so high except Kissinger fucked 
which is probably one of the worst aspects of Kissinger's legacy, is that he was a he was known as like a Playboy womanizer. And escalated during the next. Bro, stop sending me the same fucking goddamn Twitter threads over and over again. It's literally just it's this it's this video. Nixon administration. So Sorry. secret were these bombings that many in the United States Congress were unaware of it until 1970. Kissinger made a statement to the press justifying these bombings by claiming that at least American servicemen were not being killed, only Laotians and Vietnamese hiding in Laos. This statement, while morally horrendous, was also untrue. The Pentagon revealed that American servicemen had been killed in Laos during the Nixon administration. These bombings were conducted without authorization by Congress and focused heavily on civilian areas in hopes of striking secret North Vietnamese bases. Though neutral, Laos suffered as many as 115,000 casualties, almost exclusively civilian. In addition to Kissinger's initial sabotage of the peace process in 1968, he warned the Nixon administration against suing for peace once again in 1970, explaining that anything resembling surrender could negatively affect Nixon's chances in the 1972 presidential election. In other words, the war in Vietnam was extended year after year for political reasons, first to bring Nixon to power, then again to keep him there. Estimates of casualties in Indochina between 1954 to 1975 vary, partly for political reasons and partly because of the challenge of calculating... That sounds familiar. Can't put a finger on it. Dude, it's everything. It's every war. Every aspect of Western, uh, Western warfare is damn near identical to one another. Uh, you can you can look at our actions in North Korea, and then uh, and then look at the identical principles being applied to the indiscriminate bombing campaign in Gaza right now. You can look at that and and compare what Israel is doing right now in Gaza and the justifications for it to uh, to to Laos and Cambodia. You can look at our involvement in our bombing campaign in uh, Laos and Cambodia, and then. Uh, and then talk about the justifications for it with a, I mean, I guess proxy war in this circumstance. A lot of people are saying Ukraine, but America's not bombing personally in Ukraine. Even though America's interest in continuing the war in Ukraine is uh, for, for weapons manufacturers. And uh, they see it as, uh, as a war that's good because this way, this way uh, they can... They can uh, atrophy and destroy the Russian military for an, for an adversary. Involvement? You mean our involvement in everything besides ourselves? Well, I do think that um, our involvement in everything besides ourselves actually ends up harming our involvement in ourselves as well. I mean, think about it this way, dude. You, you can't get... I mean, people know this already. People make jokes about it, but like they'll be like, oh, like Putin gonna learn today why Americans don't have health care. And it's like... Yeah, like, that's kind of a joke, but also it's kind of sad. You know what I mean? Like, that's a real sad state of affairs. That Like, we just have an endless money faucet for... An endless money faucet for endless wars, but when it comes to just, like, healing ourselves, uh, we got nothing. Civilian deaths among massive bombing campaigns. Putting it all together is no small task. Among the most credible and widely sourced estimates comes from Professor Rudolf Joseph Rummel of Yale. In his study, casualties were as high as 3,595,000, including Americans, Vietnamese, Cambodians, and Laotians, both servicemen and civilians. These numbers are staggering, but this total could have been significantly lower without the sabotage and machinations of Henry Kissinger. Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos are the most well-known atrocities connected to Kissinger, but there are other crimes that must be addressed. In late 1970, the Pakistani military elite had permitted the first open elections for a decade. The vote was won by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the leader of the Bengali Awami League. The National Assembly was scheduled to meet on the 3rd of March, 1971, but General Khan, leader of the ongoing military regime, refused a peaceful transition. On March 25th, the Pakistani army struck at the Bengali capital of Dhaka and massacred Rahman's supporters. Kissinger, believing General Khan would be more supportive of United States economic interests than Rahman, sent military aid to assist in the genocide. 
Estimates for the total dead vary due to the chaos, the expulsion of the foreign press, and political interests, but according to the book Kissinger's Shadow, approximately half a million were counted among the dead, hundreds of thousands of women abused, and millions displaced from their homes. Allegedly, Nixon privately had concerns that the slaughter was comparable to the Holocaust, but Kissinger told him not to worry. In 1974, East Timor formed a post-colonial leftist government. The movement was known as the Front for the Liberation of East Timor. Under the pretext of anti-communism, East Timor's neighbor, Indonesia, invaded in an obvious power. Yeah, dude, it's crazy, but, but, like, but have you thought about why like, this should happen? Hassan, why do you say America bad all the time? I mean, after all, it's just a little bit of genocide, dog. I don't understand that we never will learn as though it was genocidal, as a matter of fact. You know? Whenever there is any kind of leftist movement, whether it be Argentina, whether it be Chile, Henry Kissinger found himself directly involved. Henry Kissinger and the American government found itself directly involved with the fascist militias that would then go and kill thousands of people, sometimes millions of people. It was all to just stop communism, okay? To stop communism. So remember that. Like, even if you don't like communism, what the fuck is it for us? Like, what do you mean? What the fuck is this? Like, what, that this is just like we arm and then, and then support psychopathic fascist dictatorships who then we arm further and support further when they engage in Stopping communism? It's pure projection. Russia's imperialist actions. You're avoiding Russia's imperialist actions. It's like, dude, what the fuck do you mean? Like, like if you are a leftist or, or fancy yourself to be a leftist, like, what do you mean? The USSR's imperialist actions? Like, like, there are so many places around the world that on their own volition, on their own volition wanted to vote and become social democracies or take action such as nationalization of extraction and in, uh, extraction industries that America would not let go. They were like, nope, that's communism. That goes directly against our material interests and the material interests of our allies. Fuck you. We're arming a fascist militia and we're going to come and kill you. And we're going to come to lead, uh, kill the leader. And then we're going to directly Put our guys in power. Oh. Hassan, you literally said America deserved 9-11. The concept of evil is made up fiction invented by the human imagination. Yes, brother. And if you don't understand what I mean by that, you will never understand that these are objectively gross and inhumane actions all around the world. Yes. We fucking 9-11'd ourselves, bitch. What do you think is going on? Power grab in 1975. Immediately before the invasion, Henry Kissinger, then Secretary of State under President Gerald Ford, met with the leaders of Indonesia. The United States supplied Indonesia with the necessary military equipment for the invasion in hopes of expelling the East Timor government and massacring a population that was not friendly to U.S. economic interests. Civilian deaths during this invasion were enormous. The United Nations concluded that the number of East Timorese who died from combat or famine during the occupation could be as high as 202,000, approximately one-third of their entire population. These incidents and massacres are only a sampling of United States war crimes in which Henry Kissinger was involved. He and Nixon plotted to overthrow Chilean President Salvador Allende. The list goes on and on. Nearly everything stated about Kissinger's involvement. We didn't even do Argentina's dirty war either. Like, we were supposed to talk about that with uh, Javier Malay, and I forgot to cover that. Involvement in Cambodia, his role in extending the Vietnam War by sabotaging the peace talks, and other crimes are widely known, mostly through first hand accounts, declassified documents, audio from the CIA and FBI, investigative journalism, and decades of research. The facts are no longer in dispute. Only perspective. War hawks excuse. What's the point of sponsoring all these revolts? Is it just for money? What do you mean, dude? It's yes, it is exactly. Let me make it very simple for you, okay? 
currently, the reason why you can get fucking t-shirts for like $3, okay, and and eat food for $4, and do whatever the fuck you want, and get a TV for $200, is literally because of unequal exchange, okay? We exploit the global south for both labor and also natural resources. But the only way that we can continue exploiting the global south is if we maintain its destabilization. We do this through multiple different, uh, uh, we do this through different ways. We do it through the IMF and World Bank, through economic imperialism. We do it through uh, direct trade relations that are not actually favorable to those nations or even ourselves, where we end up actually harming our own domestic interests because we eviscerate our own labor force. However, there's always one party that is making the most out of this. And that party is capital owners. Those who own the businesses, those who own the corporations. We do all of it at the behest of uh, improving shareholder interest. Okay? We can never allow the Global South to genuinely improve, genuinely develop, because if that happens, then it's going to be much harder for us to exploit them. Things are going to get more expensive for us, and we can't have that happening here. It's much easier to maintain dominance and maintain power by ensuring that none of these countries actually turn around and and nationalize their oil refineries or or nationalize their lithium or nationalize whatever kind of fucking uh, extraction of natural resources that they have. Because if you do that, then all of a sudden, well, that goes against neoliberal principles because if you do that, then you no longer need European or other Western corporations to come in and actually build the infrastructure and then, uh, and then, you know, take ownership over those natural resources for 20 year, 30 year contracts. Okay. You can't do any of that. You, you don't want that. You don't want that. That's socialism and it's very bad. Meanwhile, it's not even socialism. These are like social democratic principles. You've got a little bit of socialization happening in these countries and America will not let us stand. We've never stopped doing this, by the way. We've never stopped doing that, and we will continue doing that as well. Because that's how America became the most prosperous, wealthiest nation on the fucking planet. Bro thinks he knows something. I know nothing. I'm not a very intelligent guy. I just know a little bit. I know a little bit. And what I see in, in everything that I read is that, yeah, these are, there's a reason why I say America bad. This is part of it. Use the most indefensible actions, and Kissinger is put on a pedestal for his role rather than put on trial for war crimes. Why is that? War crimes are military violations of international law and international treaties, such as the Geneva Conventions. War crimes are most commonly defined by actions like intentional slaughter of innocents and torture. So, given the mountain of evidence, countless civilian deaths, and decades of unaccountable war crimes, why hasn't Henry Kissinger been charged through some international court, or extradited to a nation that he victimized? You're allowed to not like him, but you should change your title and have some respect for him. He's burning in hell right now. Probably getting domed from Nancy Reagan, really. So, who's the winner here? I don't know. <clears throat> Motherfucker can't even spell aloud. Shut up, bitch. For that matter, why haven't so many other war criminals living in the United States been tried? International prosecution of Henry Kissinger for war crimes requires a power dynamic which does not exist. The United States is a permanent Security Council member of the United Nations, granting them significant control over global politics, particularly as it pertains to war. The U.S. has military bases all over the world. The U.S. owns a considerable amount of the world's wealth and therefore has controlling interests in a great many trade deals. The U.S. has significant sway over the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. In short, the United States of America is simply not on equal footing with the rest of the world. If, say, Laos wanted to extradite Henry Kissinger, with what could Laos threaten the United States? War? Trade? Allies, if say a number. Of <laughs> what can't? Why can't you say anything nice about a great statement who achieved so much? What have you achieved? 
I achieved in serving the top of the hour ad break to you right now directly to your motherfucking face. That's what I achieved. And if you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account where you get one free Prime subscription a month. Use it on your favorite broadcaster. Hopefully that's me. Okay. Here's the three-minute ad break now, bitch. That's what I achieved. Emerson. You know damn well they're about to organize a coup against the devil. <laughs> Funny. The Indonesian invasion killed my dad's family. They fled to Australia. I didn't know Kim Sejur did that. What the fuck? of powerful nations pressured the United States to extradite a war criminal, what could they actually do if the US says no? Cut off trade? That would significantly damage the economies of these hypothetical powerful nations. Go to war? That probably would not end well for them, and frankly it would not be proportional to punishing one man. There is simply no mechanism in which other nations can pressure the United States to do something it does not want to do. Maybe on paper, sure, treaties exist, but not in reality. So, why does the United States want to protect its war criminals anyway? What does the United States gain by allowing Henry Kissinger and so many others to be safe and comfortable? Put simply, allowing Kissinger to be tried in an international court or allowing him to be extradited would not suit U.S. interests. If Kissinger were tried, the details yep. of the trial would be embarrassing to the United States, and if Kissinger yep. were convicted, it would open the door for future war crimes trials. It would prevent the United States from pursuing its policy. That's precisely why, and I've written about this extensively, I believe, I, mean, I think I've, there's still some of the articles up on Huffington Post if you care to find them. But I talked about this, I think, uh, uh, about why Obama never... I think I talked about this when George H.W. Bush died about how, like, Obama refused to prosecute George W. Bush and the invasion of the Hague Act and whatnot, but also specifically about, like, why we refuse to tarnish the reputation uh, or refuse to assess the reputation of, of those who recently died uh, as, as bloodthirsty monsters and instead look at them as elderly statesmen and rehabilitate them. And the reason as to why we do that the reason as to why we do that is because everybody understands, like everyone in positions of power understand that like they are literally doing the same shit. And if they actually were to prosecute former uh, administrations for war crimes, then they would get prosecuted by the administration that came after them in an identical capacity. And you can't have that. You can't open up that, uh, you cannot open up that Pandora's box. Which is why I've always joked about how, you know, uh, don't threaten me with a good time whenever motherfuckers were like, oh, well, if you prosecute Trump for this kind of thing, well, don't you think that Joe Biden could be prosecuted too? And it's like, yeah, no, that's great, man. I love that. Please. I want that. I love that. I want that. Give it to me. Right? I think that's a great thing. of military interventionism that has, for a long time, furthered its ultimate goal of global supremacy. If Kissinger were convicted, who would be next? Former President George W. Bush? Perhaps every living president, for that matter? Yeah. In order to maintain its global economic goals, the United States would sooner withdraw from an international treaty than help convict its war Which criminals. we did. And it Which had. we literally did. We did that. We withdrew with the... A, uh, the, the Invasion of the Hague Act, and we withdrew again in 2018 uh, under the Trump administration. In 2002, for example, the United States effectively withdrew from the treaty that established the International Criminal Court. In 2018, yeah. the United States... That's what he's... Yeah, exactly. States ...withdrew from the United Nations International Court of Justice. Some treaties end up being more like yep. suggestions for the United States. 
When Henry Kissinger dies, the articles and obituaries yep. and tributes will most likely call him a controversial figure and balance the millions who died through his actions and policies with the trade deals with China and his friendships with heads of state, as if this tips the scales of this oh-so-complicated man. Yeah, whenever liberals get mad at you guys and be like, you're a tanky, you're a tanky, what about our fucking foreign adversaries or whatever, ask them, like, do you... Like, do you or, or whenever they say, like, Hassan, all you say is America bad, right? If they, if they try to fucking hit you with that shit, ask them, like, what good power has made it illegal to extradite any of its citizens to be tried in front of the International Criminal Court? Like, it is literally legal for America, under American law, to invade the Hague. If an American service member, or any American for that matter, like diplomats and the like, are, are uh, held under detention or extradited to uh, the Hague for, inter for, for an international tribunal. Man, Kissinger has written his own history. The United States legitimizes this history through its praise of Kissinger, and it will codify this history by mourning his passing one day. When he dies, anyone who points out that these tributes are mourning a war criminal will be met with a clucking of tongues and a how dare you disrespect the dead, as if the civility of the discourse is somehow more important than the truth, more important than justice. Anyway, that was, uh, that was Renegade Cut. Great video, uh, called Henry Kissinger is a War Criminal. We're moving on from Henry Kissinger is a War Criminal.